Welcome back to this series on topology. Today we'll be starting a new topic, namely connectedness. You can find a playlist containing all the videos in this series by clicking on the info thing that should appear right now. If you enjoy this video, please consider clicking the like button so that other people can find it more easily. Connectedness is a property of topological spaces that pretty much describes what it sounds like. For example, if I draw this space here, which is a space consisting of two disjoint parts, then we would probably all agree that this space is not connected. If we wanted to formalize this intuition into a definition, we could proceed in many different ways in principle. One way would be to say that, well, this space consists of these two parts. So we have this part here and this part. So it somehow decomposes into the disjoint union of two other spaces, and hence is not connected. This type of reasoning will be the content of the definition of connectedness, which I'll share with you in this video. Another way we could say that this space is not connected is to point out that there is a point here in this part of the space and a point here in this part, and there is no path between these two points. This type of argument would leverage the intuition that in a connected space, we can get from any point to any other along some path that remains inside the space. This perspective will yield a different property called path connectedness, which will turn out to be stronger than the connectedness we'll see in this video. This means that any path connected space is connected, but the converse does not hold. So there are connected spaces which are not path connected. However, in the case of manifolds, these two notions will turn out to be equivalent. So if our spaces are sufficiently nice, then this property of connectedness we'll see in this video will turn out to be the same as path connectedness, which we'll look at in the next video. Okay, so let's look at the definition of what it means for a space to be connected. Since it's easier to say what we mean by a space not being connected, we'll actually start by defining that and then saying that a space is connected if it's not disconnected. So here's the definition of being disconnected. So suppose that we have some topological space X, then we call it disconnected if we can express this space X as the disjoint union of two non-empty open subsets of X. So perhaps this definition sounds a bit complicated at first, but the idea is essentially what I shared with you before. We would say that a space is disconnected if we can do the following. So we have some space X, and if we can decompose X into two non-empty open subsets that are disjoint from one another, so we find some decomposition into a subset U here and a subset V here, such that both of these subsets are open and they don't have any point in common, then we say that the space X is disconnected. Now that we know what it means for a space to be disconnected, we can just define connectedness as being a space that is not disconnected. So we call any space that is not disconnected, connected. This way of defining connectedness will have the consequence that it will be much easier to prove that a certain space is disconnected and much harder to prove that a space is actually connected. Why is this? Well, to prove that a space is disconnected, we just need to exhibit two disjoint non-empty open subsets U and V whose union is X. So being disconnected is like an existence property. We just need to find one example in order to show that a space is disconnected. On the other hand, in order to show that a space is connected, we need to prove that it's not possible to find two such open non-empty subsets U and V that decompose the space X. So hidden in the definition of connectedness, there is this for all quantifier, which makes proving connectedness more difficult than proving disconnectedness. This will become apparent when I share these examples with you, where I'll be able to prove that the three examples of disconnected spaces are actually disconnected, while the examples of connected spaces I'll have to leave for a later date to show that they're actually connected. Okay, so our first example of a space that is disconnected is the real line without the origin. Why is this? Well, to show that a space is disconnected, I need to give you two non-empty open subsets that are disjoint from one another, whose union is the entire space. 
Now from this drawing, I can see which subsets I need to choose. Namely, one of the subsets is going to be the open ray, which goes from minus infinity to zero. And the other subset is going to be the open ray that goes from zero to plus infinity. So the blue ray is minus infinity to zero, not included. And the orange ray is zero, not included to plus infinity. These are both open subsets. They're disjoint from one another. They're non-empty. And their union is the entire space, the real line without the origin. Hence, these two subsets disconnect the space and prove that it is disconnected. OK, let's move on to the next example, which says that the disjoint union of two closed disks in R2 is a disconnected space. Now, in this example, there's maybe a little bit of a subtlety that crops up, namely that we've defined connectedness only for spaces and not for subsets of existing spaces. This means that if we talk about the connectedness or disconnectedness of subsets of spaces, we're always considering them as spaces in their own right with the subset topology. So when I say that the disjoint union of two closed disks in R2 is disconnected, what I mean is that we're considering this disjoint union of these closed disks as a space in its own right with the subspace topology in R2. Let's prove that this space is disconnected, and the drawing I've made here should describe how I want to see this disjoint union of closed disks embedded in R2. Again, to prove that a space is disconnected, I have to exhibit two non-empty open subsets of that space that are disjoint and whose union is the entire space. Now, in this case, the subsets I'll choose are either one of these disks. So I'll choose this left disk as my subset U, and I'll choose this right disk here as my subset V. Now, it's clear that both of these subsets are disjoint from one another and that they're non-empty, simply by the way I've defined the space. So the only question that remains is whether they're both open. Now, here's where this potential for confusion might come in because these things are closed disks in R2, but because we're considering the space with a subset topology, actually any one of these disks is open with respect to the subspace topology. Why is this the case? Well, a subset of a subspace is open in the subspace topology if it's the intersection of the entire space with some open set of the larger space. So in order to show that U is an open subset in the subspace topology, we need to find an open subset in R2 whose intersection with the subspace is U. And one such subset would be the one I'm drawing here. So it's just the open ball that's slightly larger than the closed disk U. Now, if you intersect this pink set here with the subspace, what you get back is precisely U. And this shows that U is an open subset of the subspace topology. Now, a similar argument works for the subset V, and hence we've decomposed our space into two non-empty disjoint open subsets, which shows that it is disconnected. Our final example is similar to the previous one, just instead of looking at the disjoint union of closed disks, we're sort of looking at the disjoint union of a countable number of points. The claim is here that Q squared, so that's Q times Q, is disconnected viewed as a subspace of R2. To see why this is the case, maybe I'll make a little drawing of this. So here are the coordinate axes for R2. So we have two copies of the real line. Now Q2 consists of all the coordinates in this plane where both coordinates are rational numbers. So this is a bit difficult to draw, of course, because if I draw two such points in Q2, there will be infinitely many other ones in between. But because Q2 is a countable subset of R2, we can sort of think of Q2 as being like a uh, grid of points, but there's just like infinitely many of them and they're dense in the plane. Now the claim is that Q2 is disconnected as a subspace of R2, and the reason this is true is essentially because we have irrational numbers in R2. For example, we have the number pi occurring somewhere here on the real line. 
which is an irrational number. You could also choose square root 2 if you prefer. And if we consider the line whose projection to this first copy of uh, the real line is pi, then on this line there are no points of q2. Again, because the first coordinate of any such point is pi, which does not lie in the rational numbers. So the situation we have here is a bit analogous to this first example I gave up here, where we're missing a point in the real line and can then find these two disjoint non-empty open subsets. In our case, we choose u to be everything lying to the left of this line, and we choose our set v to be everything lying strictly to the right of this line. So if you wanted to write this down formally, u is the set of all points x, y in q2, which satisfy that x is strictly less than pi. And in a similar fashion, v is the set of pairs x, y in q2, where x is strictly greater than pi. Okay, so u and v are clearly non-empty subsets of q2, and moreover, their union is again q2, because we don't have any points in q2 lying on this line, and any other point is in either u or v. So the only question that remains is whether these two subsets are open, and in fact they are. Why is this? Well, u is just the intersection of this open half plane, so this half plane here in R2, with Q2. Hence we found a subset in R2, which is open, whose intersection with Q2 is U, and this shows that U is open in the subspace topology on Q2. The same argument holds for V. V is just the intersection of Q2 with this open half plane that goes up, but not including this line um, that I've drawn here in blue. All right, so that gives us three examples of disconnected spaces. And as you could see, it was fairly easy to come up with open, non-empty, disjoint subsets that show that these spaces are disconnected. On the other hand, for the examples of connected spaces, which I'm about to give, I won't give proofs for the latter two, and the first one will prove towards the end of this video. So the first example of a connected space that I'm going to give are intervals on the real line. In fact, intervals are sort of the prototypical connected space, and a lot of the theory of connected spaces tries to draw on results that hold for intervals on the real line. The second example of connected spaces that I'll give are either open or closed disks these spaces are connected. So if we just have a disk like this and view it as a topological space in its own right, then this is connected, meaning it can't be decomposed into two non-empty disjoint open subsets. And finally, the Euclidean space Rn is connected for any value of n. We will now see two characterizations of connectedness that will give us a different way to think about this property. The first states that a space x is connected if and only if the only two subsets of x that are simultaneously open and closed are the entire space x and the empty set. So remember that a closed subset is a subset whose complement is open, and so a subset that is simultaneously open and closed means that it's an open subset whose complement is also an open subset. Sometimes such subsets which are simultaneously open and closed are called clopen, which I find quite amusing. So this characterization says that x is connected if x and the empty set are the only clopen subsets of x. So let's give a proof of this property. For the first direction, we assume that x is connected. And we have to show that the only two subsets of x which are simultaneously open and closed are x and the empty set. So we suppose that u is a subset of x which is simultaneously open and closed, which I'll just call clopen here. 
What does this mean? Well, it means u is open and u complement, so that's x without u, is also open because u is closed. All right, but then, well, u and u complement are disjoint subsets whose union is, again, x. Moreover, both of these guys are open. So we found two disjoint open subsets whose union is x. Now, if both of these subsets would be non-empty, then they would disconnect x and show that x is disconnected, which would contradict our assumption that x is connected. Therefore, one of these sets has to be the empty set. Otherwise, we would have shown that x is disconnected, which is a contradiction. So this implies that either u is the empty set or u complement is the empty set. Okay, but if u is the empty set, then we've shown that u is either the empty set or x. And if u complement is the empty set, well, in that case, we have that u must be x because u complement is just x minus u. And if that is empty, then u needs to be the entire space x. So reviewing what we've done, we've assumed that x is connected. We've chosen an arbitrary subset of x, which is both open and closed, and we've shown that this arbitrary subset has to either be the empty set or x, which proves the direction we wanted to show. Now, for the other direction, we'll assume that x and the empty set are the only clopen sets of x. Now, if x can be written as the disjoint union of some subset u and v, where u and v are both open, well, in that case, we can consider u complement. What's this? Well, it's x without u. But x is just the disjoint union of u with v, and we're subtracting u from that, so that's just v. But we know that v is open by assumption, so this means that u complement is also open. So this implies that u is both open and closed, so u is clopen. And by our assumption that x and the empty set are the only clopen subsets of x, it means that u is either x or u is the empty set. But in the case where u is x and we've written x as the disjoint union of u with v, this implies that v has to be the empty set. So let's review what we've shown. We've assumed that x and the empty set are the only clopen sets of x. Furthermore, if we can write x as the disjoint union of two open sets, then either u has to be the empty set or v has to be the empty set. So this means that it's impossible to write x as the disjoint union of two open subsets which are simultaneously both non-empty. And this means that it's impossible for x to be disconnected, which means that x is connected. And this proves the other direction. Before moving on, I'd just like to mention why this characterization is useful. If we know that x is a connected space, then we also know that the only two subsets which are simultaneously open and closed are x and the empty set. As a consequence of this, if we have some subset of a connected space, which is non-empty and which is both open and closed, then it means that this subset has to be the entire space x. Why is this? Well, because x is connected, we know that the only clopen sets are x and the empty set, and because by assumption this subset we are considering, which is clopen, is not the empty set, it has to be x. Now, it's often very useful to prove that a certain subset is in fact the entire space, and if your space is connected, proving that this subset is simultaneously open and closed and also non-empty is a way to do this. The next characterization we'll look at is basically just to confirm our intuition we had at the very beginning of this video, that being connected somehow means that your space is not the disjoint union of two non-empty spaces. 
So more precisely, this proposition is saying that x is connected if and only if x is not homeomorphic to the disjoint union of non-empty spaces. Let's give a proof of this. So for the left to right direction, we're going to prove the contrapositive. We're going to assume that x is actually the disjoint union of some non-empty spaces xi, and we're going to show that x is not connected in this case. Okay, so our assumption is that x can be written as the disjoint union of some spaces xi, and these xi are all non-empty. Now our goal is to show that x is not connected, so we need to find non-empty disjoint open subsets of the space x whose union is x. Okay, so we'll just set the following. We put u to be one of the xi, so I'll just maybe say x1. We could have i run from, let's say, 1 to n here. But more generally, we could also have some infinite indexing set. I'll just focus on this case for notational simplicity. So we know that this set is non-empty by assumption, and also it's open because in a disjoint union space, every one of the original spaces that we union together disjointly is an open subset. Okay, and for our other set, which will be disconnecting our space x, we'll choose the disjoint union of all the other xi's apart from this first one. This is again non-empty by the assumption that each of the xi is non-empty, and it's also open because each of the xi is an open subset of this disjoint union space, and so the union of these xi will also be an open set. Finally, we have that x, well, this is just x1 disjoint union with this big disjoint union of the other xi's, but this is just u disjoint union v. We know that u and v are both non-empty and open, so this shows that x is disconnected. Okay, so that proves the left to right direction. The other direction is basically just the definition of connectedness. So if x is not homeomorphic to a disjoint union of non-empty spaces, well, this means that we can't write x as u disjoint union v for non-empty u and v, and this means that x is not disconnected, which means that x is connected. So an easier way to write this down formally is to again prove the contrapositive. So we assume that x is not connected. What does this mean? Well, it means that x is the disjoint union of u and v, where u and v are open, and they're also non-empty. But, well, in this case, we've written x as a disjoint union of two subspaces, namely u and v, which are non-empty. So this proves that we have, well, not this second property, which I'll call star for convenience. So that does not hold, which proves this right to left direction using the contrapositive. Okay, so we've proved this characterization. And this, again, was just to confirm that our intuitive idea of connectedness as being the fact that a space does not have these two disjoint parts to it, that this is a correct intuition. The next thing we'll look at is how the property of being connected interacts with continuous functions. And the important result here is that if x and y are both topological spaces, and we have a continuous function going from x to y, then if x is connected, then so is its image f of x. In other words, if you have some connected space and you map it to some other space using a continuous function, then the image under this map will remain connected. So in some sense, we can push the property of being connected forward along some continuous map. This will prove to be really useful for proving connectedness of spaces 
because once we have some repertoire of spaces we're sure that they're connected, then we can define continuous functions from those connected spaces to some space we're trying to prove is connected, and then anything in the image of that function will be connected. So in particular, if we can define a surjective continuous function from a connected space to some arbitrary space, then that arbitrary space will have to be connected. Another reason this result is important is that it shows that being connected is a topological property, meaning that any space that is homeomorphic to a connected space is itself connected. So if we have two spaces that are homeomorphic to one another, and one of them is connected, then so is the other. This shouldn't be surprising because we defined connectedness in terms of open sets of spaces, and homeomorphisms preserve open sets, so they should also preserve those properties that have been defined in terms of open sets. Let's give a proof of this proposition. So we assume that X is a connected space, and that we have a continuous function going from x to y. Now the first step we're going to do is we're going to restrict this function f to its image to get a function f bar going from x to f of x, which is also continuous. We saw that this worked in the video on continuous functions, but you can also just easily check this directly. The reason we're making this move is because now f bar is not just continuous, it's also surjective. This will prove important in the proof. Now our goal is to show that the image f of x is connected. And the way we're going to do this is by contradiction. So we're going to assume that f of x is disconnected. So this means that it's the disjoint union of two open sets, u and v, which are also non-empty. Now the way we're going to achieve a contradiction is we're going to look at the pre-images of u and v and show that they will disconnect the original space x, which we assume to be connected. And this contradiction will lead us to conclude that such a disconnection of f of x cannot exist. Okay, so we consider the pre-image of u under this function f bar, and also the pre-image of v under this function f bar. So the first thing I will claim is that these are both open sets. This is easy to see. Well, u and v are both open sets, and f bar is a continuous function, so by definition, their pre-images will also be open. Now the second thing I'll claim is that they're also non-empty. This is also not too hard to come up with with the assumptions we have. So to show that, say, the inverse image of u is non-empty, we have to produce some element in it. How do we go about this? Well, first we choose an element in u, which exists because u is non-empty. In particular, this element will also be an element of the image f of x because u is a subset of f of x. Now, because this function f bar is surjective, there exists some element in x which maps to this element in u that we've chosen, and that element will be in the pre-image. Therefore, this pre-image of u under f bar is non-empty. And the same argument also works for the pre-image of v. Now to conclude that these two pre-images actually disconnect the original space x to obtain our contradiction, we have to show in addition that they're disjoint from one another and that their union is x. For disjointness, we again proceed by contradiction. So we suppose that we have some element small x in the intersection of both these pre-images. So this means that f bar of x simultaneously lies in u because x is in the pre-image of u under f bar and also f bar of x lies in v because x is in the pre-image of v under f bar. So this means that 
f bar of x lies in the intersection of u of v. And by assumption, because u and v are disjoint, this is the empty set. And this is a contradiction, because we can't have any element in the empty set. So this contradiction leads us to conclude that actually these two sets are disjoint. Finally, we need to show that the union of these two sets is x. So for this, we let z be some arbitrary element in the space x. And now we look at the image of z under f bar. Well, this lies in the image of the space x under f. But by our assumption, this is u disjoint union v. So this implies that f bar of z lies either in u or f bar of z lies in v. Now in the former case, if f bar of z lies in u, this by the definition of the pre-image means that z lies in the pre-image of u under f bar. And in the latter case, if f bar of z lies in v, then z would lie in the pre-image of v. Hence, z lies in the union of these two pre-images. Well, and this in turn implies that this union has to be x. Because x is contained in the union, and conversely, each of these pre-images is contained in x, so their union is contained in x, so the two sets have to be equal. Okay, so in summary, we started with this assumption that f of x was disconnected by sets u and v. We looked at the pre-images of these disconnecting sets and saw that they're open, non-empty, they're disjoint, and their union is equal to x. So in fact, these two sets disconnect x. So in fact, these two sets disconnect x, which means that x is disconnected. But this is a contradiction to our assumption above that x is connected. Therefore, our hypothesis that f of x is disconnected must be false. So in fact, f of x must be connected. And this is precisely what we set out to show. OK, great. So this is one of the most important properties about connected spaces. So be sure to remember this one. We'll now turn to several other properties of connected spaces that are useful to know. In particular, we'll show how we can construct new connected spaces out of old ones. So we already know one way of doing so. If we have a connected space and we have a continuous function into some other space, then the image of the original space under that function is again connected. But here we'll show some other ways to do this. The first property we'll look at is more of a technical type of result. So we suppose that we have two disjoint open subsets, u and v, of a space x. And now if we have any connected subspace of x, which I'll call a, and a is contained in the union of u and v, which is actually a disjoint union because we're assuming that u and v are disjoint, then a has to either be completely contained in u or a has to be completely contained in v. We'll see in the proof that this is basically just a consequence of the connectedness property for the subspace A. So our hypotheses are that U and V are disjoint and open, and that A is a subset of their union. Moreover, we're assuming that A is connected. We're now going to intersect A with both U and V and observe that if both of these intersections are non-empty, then these intersections would disconnect A, which would lead to a contradiction. So we consider A intersected U and also A intersected V. Now, what do we know about these intersections? Well, because U and V are open sets of the space X, and A is a subspace of X, these are intersections of A with open sets of the larger space 
meaning that they're open in the subspace topology. Moreover, because the sets U and V are disjoint, these two sets are also disjoint. Because if we have any point that lies within their intersection, such a point would lie both in U and in V, which is impossible. Finally, we want to show that the union of these two sets is equal to the entire subspace A. So for this, we consider A intersect U unioned with A intersect V. And now by the distributive property of intersections over unions, this is equal to A intersect U union V. So recall from basic set theory that if you have an intersection and then this bracket with a union in between, you can distribute out this intersection to the two factors in this way. Now, because A is contained in U union V, it means that this intersection is actually just A. So this follows from the fact that A is contained in U union V. And hence we've shown that the union of these two sets is equal to the entire subspace A. Okay, so we started with a connected space A, and we've now found two subsets, namely A intersect U and A intersect V, that are both open, that are disjoint from one another, and whose union is the entire subspace. Now, if both of these subsets were non-empty, then they would disconnect A, which would be a contradiction to the assumption that A is connected. Therefore, either A intersect U has to be empty, or A intersect V has to be empty. This, in turn, implies the conclusion we wanted, namely that A has to either be contained entirely within U, or A has to be either contained entirely within V. To see how this last step follows from the previous one, we assume that A intersect U is empty, so that's one case. Well, if we take any element small a in A, then A cannot lie in U, because A intersect U is empty. And now since A is contained in the union of U and V, this implies that A has to lie in V. Essentially, there's no other option, so because A is contained in the union of U and V, it means that this small a has to lie either in U or in V, but A does not lie in U, so A lies in V. But this small a was arbitrary, so in summary we've shown that A is actually a subset of V. Therefore, in the case where A intersection U is empty, we've proved that A is a subset of V, and similarly, in the case where A intersection V is empty, one can show by replacing U with V that A is a subset of U. Okay, so that's the conclusion we wanted, and with that we're done with the proof. We can now use the previous property to prove something that's maybe a bit more obviously useful, namely the following. So if we have some space X and we have some collection B alpha of connected subspaces of X, then their union is connected, provided that all of these B alpha share at least one point. So this means that there's some point P, which lies in each of the B alpha. So to prove this, we'll show that it's not possible to disconnect the union of these B alpha. So first we give this point they share in common a name. So this point P lies in the intersection of all the B alphas. And now we suppose that there is some way to write these B alphas as a disjoint union of U and V, where U and V are open and non-empty. So we're assuming for the sake of contradiction that these, this union of the B alphas is actually disconnected. We now use this common point P so we know that P either lies in U or P lies in V. So we assume without loss of generality that P lies in U. And the other case where P lies in V is exactly the same where we just replace the set U with V. 
Now we know that for each alpha, B alpha is contained in the union over all the B alphas, which is equal to U union V. Moreover, this B alpha here is connected. And U and V are disjoint open subsets of this uh, larger space, which is the union of the B alphas. Therefore, by the previous property, this B alpha has to lie either completely within U or completely within V. But now, since the point P lies in B alpha, and also P lies in U, we can only actually have the case that the B alpha is contained in U. But our choice of alpha here was arbitrary, which means that, well, all B alpha lie in U, which implies that the union of all the B alphas is contained in U. But then this means that actually V is the empty set. So to see why this is the case, we've written this union of the B alpha as a disjoint union U and V, but now this entire union lies within U, so in order to have equality here, V has to be the empty set. I mean, otherwise, this set here on the right would contain elements that don't lie in here. On the other hand, we've assumed that U and V are both non-empty, and, well, we've shown that V is empty, which is a contradiction, and this means that it's not possible to decompose the union of B alpha into these disjoint sets U and V, which are non-empty and open, and this implies that this union of all the B alphas is actually connected. So in summary, if we have some collection of connected subspaces, then their union is also connected, provided that all of these subspaces share one point in common. And this gives us another way of constructing new connected spaces from old ones by unioning, provided that we have this common point. We can further build up on this previous property by now showing that any product of finitely many connected spaces is again connected. Now by induction, it suffices to prove this for just two spaces, because we can then iteratively take a product of, well, first two, then take a product with another one, then we have three spaces and so on, until we get products of all finite length. So I'm going to suppose that we have spaces X and Y, which are connected. And now we want to show that their product is connected. As is often the case in these proofs, we proceed by contradiction. So we suppose that X times Y is equal to the disjoint union of U and V, where again, U and V are open and non-empty. Now, because u is non-empty, there exists some point x0, y0 in u. And we now observe that the set x0, so this is the singleton set containing x0 times y. Well, this is homeomorphic to y. This is connected because y is connected. And we saw previously that homeomorphisms preserve connectivity. Now, because this set here is connected, and we have this situation where we have these disjoint open sets U and V, and moreover, this set is contained in the union U and V because this set is contained in the product X times Y, we know that this connected set has to be contained either in U or in V. On the other hand, we also know that this element here, x0, y0, this was assumed to lie in U, and this implies that, well, this set has to be contained in U and not in V. And this means that 
In fact, not only x0, y0 is contained in u, but also x0, y is an element of u for all y and y. So using our connectedness hypothesis, we somehow expanded from the assumption that we have a point x0, y0 in u to the fact that any x0, y, where y is arbitrary, also has to lie in u. In fact, we're now going to expand this further to show that, in fact, any pair of points has to lie in u, which will lead to a contradiction. Similar to before, we observe that x times the singleton y is connected, and this holds for any y in y. But now again, because this space is connected here, and it is contained in this union of u and v, where u and v are open disjoint sets, we have to have that x times y is either contained in u, or x times the singleton y is contained in v. But because x0, y is an element of u for all y, so in particular for this y we've chosen here, it means that x times the singleton y has to be contained in u. Moreover, this holds for any y, so this statement is actually again for all small y and y. So finally, we observe that the entire product x times y is the union over all the elements, small y and y, of these sets x times the singleton y. From before, we know that each of these sets, x times the singleton y, is contained in u, and therefore their union is also contained in u. On the other hand, our assumption from before states that x times y is the disjoint union of u and v. But now we have that the disjoint union of u and v is contained in u, and the only way that this is possible is if v is the empty set. Otherwise, we would have some element here in v which is not in u. However, in our assumption up here, we assumed that both u and v were non-empty, and now we've proved that v is actually the empty set. This is a contradiction, and therefore we can't write x times y as a disjoint union of u and v, where u and v are both open and non-empty, and this shows that, in fact, x times y is connected. Perhaps this proof isn't very intuitive, but essentially we proceed by contradiction. We start with some point in u, and then we kind of bootstrap ourselves up to the entire product x times y being contained in u. So first we go from a single point being contained in u to this type of cylinder x0 times y being contained in u. And then we show that the sort of dual cylinders x times singleton y's, they're also all contained in u. And then we can union all of those together and show that this product needs to be contained in u, which yields our contradiction. More important than remembering this proof is to remember the statement that if you have connected spaces and you take a product of them, then the result will again be connected, provided that you only do this finitely many times. Our final property is a direct consequence of this theorem we saw that the image of a connected space under a continuous function is connected. Namely, we apply that theorem to quotient spaces. And this yields the property that any quotient of a connected space is again connected. We can prove this immediately as follows. So we suppose that Q is a quotient of a connected space X. Well, we have this surjective quotient map going from x to q. So this is surjective and continuous by the theorem we saw previously 
we know that the image of x under this continuous map q is connected. But because this quotient map is surjective, this image is just the entire quotient space. And that's precisely what we wanted to prove. This is perhaps the most important one of the properties A through D, because it allows us to come up with a lot of examples of connected spaces once we already have established that certain spaces are connected. For example, if we know that Rn is connected, then we now know that any quotient of Rn will be connected. Intuitively, this makes sense if you start with something that's connected and you shrink certain parts of it or identify certain parts of it, the space should remain connected, intuitively speaking. But this property now proves this rigorously, and we'll be using this a lot because quotients appear a lot as constructions of new spaces. So far, I've presented several characterizations for connected spaces, and I've also shown you how you can get new connected spaces from old ones, but I haven't actually proved yet that any given space is connected. The following proposition will remedy this by classifying all of the connected subsets of the real line. It states that the connected subsets of R are precisely the empty set, the points, and also intervals. For this, recall that a subset J of the real line is an interval if it has the following property, namely that if we take any two points A and B and J, and we have some intermediate point C that lies between A and B, then also C must lie in the interval J. Okay, so that's what it means to be an interval. And this proposition is claiming that aside from the empty set and points, which are easily seen to be connected, the intervals are the only subsets of the real line that are connected. Now, in order to prove this proposition, we'll have to use several properties of real numbers, which means that this proof will be more of a real analysis proof rather than a topology proof. Since I haven't really covered many of these concepts in this topology course, um, don't worry if you can't follow along very well. If you want, you can just take the statement of this proposition as a fact and move on, or you can try to follow along with the proof and see that, in principle, um, we're just using these basic properties of real numbers, although the proof is a bit complicated and maybe not so nice to look at. In order to prove the statement, we have to prove two directions. First of all, we have to show that the empty set points and intervals are indeed connected. And then we need to show that any other type of subset of the real line is disconnected. Okay, so for the forward direction, we'll first prove that the empty set and points are connected. This will be fairly easy. The reason for this is that uh, we cannot write the empty set or some singleton set just containing a point as u disjoint union v for u and v non-empty. So in the case of the empty set, this is pretty obvious because whenever u and v would be non-empty, we would get some element in the empty set if we were to write the empty set as a union of u and v. So if we write the empty set as some union, then both of the sets have to be empty. And the case for points is similar. So if we have a singleton set which just has one element and we write it as a union u disjoint union v, then, well, this single element has to be contained either in u or in v, and the other set has to be empty. Therefore, it's not possible to even write the empty set or a singleton set in terms of such a disjoint union with two non-empty sets, and therefore, we also can't write them as a disjoint union with two non-empty open subsets. And hence, these spaces will be connected by default. Okay, so that was fairly easy. Now comes the more difficult part of the proof, which is to show that intervals will be connected. So for this, we let J be some interval And we suppose that we can disconnect J, which means that J is equal to the disjoint union between U and V. So where U and V are open and non-empty. 
So what does this mean? Well, u and v being open, this is with respect to the subspace topology. So this means that u is equal to some open set u bar of the real line intersected with the subspace j, and v is equal to some open subset v bar of the real line intersected with the subspace j. And well, these u bar and v bar, they are open sets in R. Okay, now since u and v are assumed to be non-empty, they contain points. So we can take some element A in u and some element B in v, and we assume that A is strictly less than B. We can do this because A and B must be distinct because the sets U and V are disjoint. So either A is strictly less than B or B is strictly less than A by properties of the real line. And if the opposite inequality holds from what I claimed here, then we can just relabel the sets U and V to get the desired inequality. Now, because J is an interval, and A and B are two points in J, it means that every point in between A and B also needs to lie in J. One way of writing this is to say that the closed interval from A to B is a subset of J. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that U bar and V bar are open to obtain neighborhoods which are still contained within u and v respectively. So since u bar and v bar are open, there exists some epsilon greater zero such that the following two things hold. So the first thing that I want to hold is that the half open interval from a to a plus epsilon is a subset of u bar. So I can do this because u bar is open. And also, I want that the half open interval in the other direction, b minus epsilon to b, is contained in v bar. Again, this works because um, v bar is an open set of the real line. Moreover, I can even get more out of this epsilon. So if I choose this epsilon small enough so that the number a plus epsilon is still less than or equal to b, then this half open interval will also be contained in the interval from A to B. So by choosing epsilon appropriately small, I can not only have this half open interval here be a subset of U bar, but I can also have it be a subset of this closed interval from A to B. And a similar thing will work for the other half open interval if I choose epsilon small enough so that b minus epsilon is still greater than a, then this half an open interval here will also be a subset of the closed interval from a to b. All right, now another thing we can observe is that, well, this set here, so the intersection of u bar intersected with this closed interval, this is going to be a subset of u bar intersected with j because this closed interval from a to b is a subset of j. And this thing here, well, this is just u. And similarly on the bottom, v bar intersected the closed interval from a to b. This is contained in v bar intersect j, which is v. Moreover, by hypothesis, u and v are disjoint from one another and as a consequence, any subsets of U and V will also be disjoint. So in particular, these sets here, this U bar intersected um, with the interval from A to B and V bar intersected with the interval from A to B, these will also be disjoint. All right, so so far we've assumed that we could disconnect J as U disjoint union V and we performed all of this setup by constructing these various sets. And now we're going to obtain a contradiction by defining an element C, which simultaneously is contained in J, but is neither contained in U bar nor in V bar. Now, since J is a subset of U bar union V bar, this will be impossible and will prove the fact that J has to be connected. 
how do we define this element C that will lead to the contradiction? Well, we define it as a supremum of the following set, namely the set U bar intersected with the closed interval from A to B. Recall that the supremum of a set is its least upper bound. So in this case, C is going to be greater than any element occurring in this set here. And simultaneously, if we have an upper bound of the set, then C will be less than or equal to that upper bound. All right, so in order to get the contradiction, we need to show on the one hand that C is contained in J. How do we do this? Well, we're going to observe that C lies between A plus epsilon and B minus epsilon. Why is this? Well, the first inequality here on the left follows from the fact that this set here, this half open interval from A to A plus epsilon is actually contained within the set we're taking the supremum of. So we know that the supremum of this half open interval here is A plus epsilon. And on the other hand, because this set is contained in this set, it means that the supremum of this set is at least as big as the supremum of this set, which was A plus epsilon. So C being the supremum of this set has to be at least as big as the supremum of this set, which is A plus epsilon, and that gives us this inequality on the left here. On the other hand, this inequality on the right follows from the fact that B minus epsilon is actually an upper bound of this set, and therefore the supremum C needs to be less than or equal to this upper bound. To see why b minus epsilon is an upper bound of u bar intersected with the interval from a to b, suppose we have some x in this set u bar intersected with the interval from a to b, and x is strictly greater than b minus epsilon. So this would be the assumption that b minus epsilon is not an upper bound. Well, then this implies that x is actually an element of this half open interval from b minus epsilon to b, but this is a subset of v bar intersected with the interval from a to b, which is disjoint from u bar intersected the interval from a to b. So on the one hand, x is in this u bar intersected the interval from a to b, but also x is in v bar intersected the interval from a to b, and these two are disjoint, which is a contradiction. Therefore, no such x, which is strictly greater than b minus epsilon, can exist within this set, which shows that b minus epsilon is an upper bound of this set, which then proves that the supremum of this set needs to be less than or equal than b minus epsilon. Okay, so this string of inequalities now shows that c is an element of this closed interval from a to b, which is a subset of J, as we saw before, and we know that J is equal to the disjoint union between U and V, which in turn is a subset of U bar union V bar, because U is a subset of U bar and V is a subset of V bar. We're now going to conclude the proof by showing that despite the fact that C is an element of this union U bar union V bar, C can neither be contained in U bar nor in V bar which is a contradiction. First, we'll show that it's not possible for C to be an element of U bar, for if C is an element of U bar, then there exists some delta greater zero, such that the open interval from C minus delta to C plus delta would be contained in U bar. So this is just because U bar is an open set of the real line. But again, we can choose this delta to be small enough such that this open interval is also contained in the closed interval from A to B. We can see this works from the inequality we had before. If you rearrange things here, this left-hand side becomes that A is less than or equal to C minus epsilon. So in particular, if we choose delta to be less than epsilon, then C minus delta will still be greater or equal than A. And the same thing works with the other inequality. If we rearrange this a bit, we get that C plus epsilon is less than or equal to B. And if we choose delta to be less than epsilon, again, C plus delta will be less than or equal to B. 
under the assumption that C is an element of U bar, we can find such an open interval around C, which is contained within U bar intersected with this closed interval from A to B. Now this is directly a contradiction to the fact that C is supposedly the supremum of this set U bar intersected with the closed interval from A to B. To see this contradiction, we consider the number C plus delta halves, which on the one hand is strictly greater than C, but on the other hand, it's also contained within this open interval from C minus delta to C plus delta, which supposedly is a subset of U bar intersection this closed interval from A to B. And this is a contradiction because we've now found an element of this set we were taking the supremum of, which is strictly greater than the supremum. Therefore, we conclude that C cannot be an element of U bar. On the other hand, if C is an element of V bar, then by similar reasoning, there exists some gamma greater zero, such that C minus gamma, C plus gamma, is contained within V bar intersected with this closed interval from A to B. So the containment in V bar follows from the fact that V bar is open and we can choose gamma small enough that this uh, open interval is still contained within the closed interval from A to B. Now, this statement will again lead to a contradiction to the fact that C is a supremum because we can consider C minus gamma halves. This is a number which is strictly less than C. And in fact, it is still a upper bound of the set we were taking the supremum of. So this number here is still upper bound of the set U bar intersected with the closed interval from A to B. Why is this? Well, the argument is similar to the way we established this inequality up here. Namely, suppose we have some x in u bar intersected with the closed interval from a to b, and x is strictly greater than c minus gamma halves. Well, in that case, x will lie within this open interval from c minus gamma to c plus gamma, which is a subset of v bar intersected with the closed interval from A to B, but we know that this set here is disjoint from the set U bar intersected with the closed interval from A to B, so this is impossible, and therefore C minus gamma halves is still an upper bound of this set U bar intersected with the closed interval from A to B. Okay, so under the assumption that C is in V bar, we find a number that is strictly smaller than C, which is still an upper bound of the set that C is supposedly the supremum of. And this is a contradiction to the fact that C is the least upper bound of that set. And therefore it's also not possible for C to be an element of V bar. Hence in summary, C is an element of U bar union V bar because C is an element of J. So that's what we established up here. But on the other hand, C is neither in U bar nor in V bar. And this thing is a huge contradiction, which now finally allows us to conclude that our original assumption that we can disconnect J with these sets U and V must be false. And therefore J is connected. So as you can see, proving that intervals are connected is quite involved, but we didn't actually use any sophisticated tools. We just had to use the fact that the real numbers have suprema and then construct all of these small intervals and well show that this element C can't be contained in either of U bar and V bar and so on. Luckily, now that we've done all this hard work, we can put it behind us and not have to worry about this sort of thing again, we can just take it as a fact that intervals are now connected. All right, so far in this proof, I've shown the left to right direction, namely that the empty set points and intervals are all connected subsets of R. Now we need to show the converse, namely that there are no other connected subsets in R. All right, so for the other direction, we're going to assume 
that we have some subset, which we'll call S of R, which is neither, well, the empty set, a point, or an interval. So in particular, S contains at least two distinct points. Otherwise, it would be either a point or the empty set. And, well, there exists, well, two distinct points A and B in S with A strictly less than B. And moreover, there also exists a C with C lying between A and B, but C not being an element of S. Why does this last thing hold? Well, we know that S contains at least two distinct points. And moreover, we also know that S is not an interval. So this means that for at least one choice of two distinct points, there has to be an intermediate point C, which is not contained in S. Otherwise, we would have this defining condition for an interval satisfied, namely that for any two points in the set there and any intermediate point, that intermediate point lies in the set. So because S is not an interval, this condition here cannot hold. So in particular, we have two points in S and an intermediate point C where C does not lie in S. Okay, so we now want to show that S is in fact disconnected. So we need to construct some open non-empty sets which are disjoint whose union is S. And the way to do this is now pretty straightforward now that we have this C which does not lie in S. Perhaps I can draw a picture of the situation. So we know that our subset S contains two points, A and B, and there's some C, which is not an element of S. And what we're now going to do is we're going to construct disconnecting sets by intersecting S with open rays going from C to infinity and from minus infinity to C. So in the picture, we'll just intersect S with this open ray here, and with this open ray here. And this disconnection will work precisely because C is not an element of S. Okay, so we put U to be equal to S intersected with the open ray going from minus infinity to C, and V is S intersected with the open ray going from C to infinity, and well, now we need to check all of the properties of these sets. First, because, well, these open rays here are open in R and we're intersecting them with S, it means that U and V are open sets in the subspace topology on S. So both of these are open. Moreover, because these rays here are disjoint from one another, it means that also if we intersect S with the rays, the result will remain disjoint. So these sets are disjoint from one another. And finally, they're non-empty because A is contained in U and B is contained in V. Now, the final thing we need to check is that, in fact, U union V is again S, but this is clear because C is not contained in S. So U union V is, well, it's S intersected with minus infinity to C, union S intersected with C to infinity, and using, again, distributive properties of sets, this is S intersected with the union of these two open rays. So this is the real line without this single point C. And now because C is not an element of S, this intersection here is just, again, S, because we're essentially just removing C from S, but C is not an element of S, so we just get S. Okay, so together this proves that S is disconnected, 
and S was an arbitrary set, which was not the empty set, a point, or an interval, and therefore we've shown that, in fact, the only connected subsets of R are the empty set, points, and intervals. And this concludes our classification. To see some of our work pay off towards the end, I'd like to present this generalized version of the intermediate value theorem. Recall that the intermediate value theorem from real analysis states that if you have a continuous function going from an interval to the real line, then that function attains every value between the image of the one endpoint and the image of the other endpoint. And this theorem here is a generalization of that where we replace the interval with an arbitrary connected space x. It precisely states that if x is some connected space and we have a continuous function going from x to the real numbers and we have points p and q in x, then this function attains every value between f of p and f of q. And the proof of this is now really easy using all the tools we've established so far. So we know that because x is connected, that f of x has to be connected because f is a continuous function. On the other hand, f of x is a subset of the real line, and this means that f of x is either a singleton or an interval. Now, suppose we take points p and q and x. And now we consider their images under f. Well, on the one hand, if f of p is equal to f of q, then there are no points in between these two values. So the function attains every value in between these two values. So in that case, we're fine. And on the other hand, if f of p is strictly less than f of q, well, then since f of p and f of q both lie within f of x, which is an interval, well, this implies that for any c, which lies between f of p and f of q, we must have that c is in f of x. And so there exists some small z in the space x such that f of z is equal to c because c lies in the image of x under f. So therefore, f attains every value between f of p and f of q. Okay, so let me recap what we did in this video. First, we defined what it means for a space to be connected, namely that we can't decompose the space into two disjoint non-empty open subsets. We then saw two characterizations of being connected, the most important of which was that a space is connected if and only if the only two subsets that are simultaneously open and closed are the entire space and the empty set. We then saw some ways to get new connected spaces out of old ones. In particular, we saw that the image of a connected space under a continuous function is again connected. We also saw that finite products of connected spaces are connected and that unions of connected spaces are connected if they have a point in common. Then in order to actually generate examples of connected spaces, we have to show that some space is in fact connected. And the one we can do this for is intervals of the real line. So we proved that the connected non-empty subsets of the real line are precisely the singletons and the intervals. We were then able to exploit the hard work we did in that proof to prove a generalized version of the intermediate value theorem, which holds for continuous functions going from connected spaces to the real line. And in that case, such a function attains every value between the image of two points in the connected space. In the next video, we'll continue our look at connectedness properties by looking at a new property called path connectedness.